on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I'm telling everybody out there, if anybody asks, uh, offers you to be agent assistant, sounds good and it makes you feel like, oh, I made it, but don't do it. You can do it yourself. I know that for a fact. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, yes, it's The Self-Publishing Show. It's James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. I almost said James and Mark, and then I, I just bundled through and changed it. So we used to do the James and Mark show, and now we introduce it full frame, looking into camera, owning, owning it, Mark. You look to the back of the lens, straight down into the back of the eyes of the viewer. That's how I deliver my punches. I aim behind the head. Is this your Lemmy from Motorhead story? Oh yeah, we'll do it another time for that one perhaps. We'll do that at the self-publishing show live. We should talk about the self-publishing show live, but I'll tell you what, before we talk about anything, I'm going to welcome our Patreon supporters. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Is Lemmy one of them? Lemmy is sadly no longer able to join us on Patreon <laughs> for know, reasons that's... of being in the ground. That's very true. Um, poor Lemmy, rest in rock. Uh, we have new Patreon supporters and we're going to say hello to them. Thank you so much indeed for supporting the show. We're going to say hello to Sidoni Bouvier and Christine Donnelly. And also joining us uh, today, Alicia Anthony from Ohio in the United States of America and Shay Blizzard. Thank you very much indeed. Some good names in there. Bouvier, I think, is Marge's maiden name in The Simpsons. It is, yes. Before we get off this, I think there might be a couple more that were sent to you previously than from today. Unless I, think I've, I think I've cleverly done them. Okay, fair enough. If you say so. I've cleverly encapsulated them all. Yes, Shay Blizzard's a good name. Do you think that's an author name or do you think that's a real name? I don't know. We should ask Shay. Shay will have to let us know. Is James uh, Blatch a real name or an author name? Who knows? I uh, got a good interview actually coming up with Barry Hutchinson, who we bumped into at the London Book Fair last year. And I spoke to him about changing genre, about specifically sh- choosing a genre to make money and, uh, you know, finding that sweet spot between what you want to do and uh, a genre that sells. Because he writes comedy science fiction, which I love his comedy science fiction, but uh, it's a smallish uh, area. So he's moved into police procedure. I think he sat listening to LJ Ross enough over the years on these panels to think. He did. It was at last year's London Book Fair. I think he was listening to, to me, and I'm going to claim a little bit, a small slice of credit for that as well. But yes, he said to me he he listened to both of us and decided he was going to go into a slightly bigger genre. And spoiler alert, he is making money. He is. He's doing quite, really quite well. Quite a lot of it, I think. <laughs> yeah, he's done really well. He's a great writer. Um, but he was talking about his author name. So he's come up with J.D. Kirk. Mm. Uh, and he researched it meticulously. I mean, there's obviously a little bit of a, not, uh, a reference to his science fiction uh, passion. And he almost came up with J.T. Kirk, which is... Uh, the actual initials of Captain Kirk, but he went with J.D. Kirk um, and he looked at how they appeared on the books and how they sounded and and he's done all of this carefully. Um, I mean, some people, very, very poncy people on BBC Two in the evening would say, well, this is terribly tawdry. BBC Two? BBC Two. Oh, yes, BBC Two, yes. Yes, yes. channel in the, a a cerebral channel in the UK Mm, would say this is terribly tawdry and tacky, uh, but of course it's, exactly the type of decisions that every other business on the entire planet makes every day of the week. And um, maybe the traditional industry has just been a bit, a bit um, clever at keeping authors away from that end of things. So it feels like it's not their area, but it absolutely 100% is. And it's a good interview. Anyway, but Barry Hutchinson's mm. coming up in the future. Today's interview is sensational. It's with a brilliant uh, woman who's lived a brilliant life. Her name uh, is Jerry Williams, and she has been an FBI agent uh, for her entire life. Um, in fact, she was, I think she says in the interview, she was like the second or third black agent uh, in the States. And obviously she's a woman as well. So really pioneering con- for for when she joined. Um, and she just knows the service inside out. She's uh, one of those people who, of course, knows it so well that when she watches TV and reads books and they get it wrong or they do things that just wouldn't happen in the agency and people misunderstand what the FBI's role is in these situations. Um, it gnarls her a little bit, so she's done something about it and written a brilliant book uh, on 
The Myths of the FBI. And it's a book, if you're writing in this area, if you set something in America as a major crime and the FBI are at any point involved, you really want to familiarize yourself with some of this stuff we go through in the interview. And there's a there's a handout as well, which you get at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash FBI, uh, which I'd thoroughly recommend. Right, that's coming up in a minute. Shall we talk about the self-publishing, uh, the inaugural self-publishing show live? Yes, yeah. So um, we've, we've had a busy week or 10 days We since we decided to do it. We, um, it's all been fairly fast, as tends to be the case when we do things. So, so we decided we we're going to do it. We, we found a venue. So um, Tom... And me mostly were, were looking at these potential venues. And we found the National Gallery in London, so on Trafalgar Square. Very, very nice. We've got a lovely lecture theatre with 328 seats there. Now, before that, we were going to think about we was going to be at Amazon's HQ, but for different reasons, that didn't didn't happen. Although Amazon are still sponsoring the show. Um, we so we found the, the gallery and thought, yeah, that'd be good. We'll, we'll do it there. So we, we put tickets on sale. Um, and the, we did it. The first 150 sold out in five minutes. We then... To close the cart and we did a separate opening so that people in different time zones wouldn't be disadvantaged um and we sold another 100 tickets in 90 seconds um and at that point i realized that this was probably there's a bit of demand for it so we had things like um google analytics on the sales page so we could see that 800 people were trying to get tickets we crashed the sales page because too many people were trying to get in at, at the same time um, we were getting angry emails from people who were annoyed with us because um I don't know. They, they seem to think that we're professional event organizers. Who, yes. Whoever would have thought that. Um, <laughs> so I can this, understand why. I should point out this is our first radio. This is our, this, yes, this is our first radio when it comes to doing an event. So um, we then, so we had 300 tickets sold and we thought, okay, let's see if we can, we'll find somewhere bigger. So um, again, Tom, me and Lucy this time spent another couple of days um looking for uh, other venues. And we actually got some help from um, Sarah uh, Weldon, who is um, a, a member of the community who has a connection at the South Bank Centre in London, which is, for those who don't know, is um, very uh, kind of the artistic quarter of London on the Thames um, near Waterloo Station. A couple of big concert halls in there, including the Queen Elizabeth Hall, which has 900 capacity. And uh, we thought, well, should we go for that? feels a bit big. Um, you know, it wouldn't be great if we only sold another 400 if we had 400 or 500 tickets sold, we'd have half the room empty. But anyway, we, we, we bit the bullet and we uh, put them on sale uh, again um, on Friday, I think it was. Yeah, it was on Friday. Yeah. And we, as we record this, we sold out about six hours ago. So Yeah, and it's Monday today. So we've sold out in, in four days. And we were more or less, we were down to double figures very quickly and down to single figures overnight on Sunday night. So we have 840 tickets sold, about 845 tickets sold now. So the, the remainder is, obviously, there'll be um, industry guests, speakers, us. Um, what else? There'll be Amazon staff, people like that. There'll be, there will be other people coming in. Um, I suspect we'll have about 10 tickets um, at the end of that. Um, and there'll be some people, I guess, who'll return there so you can't come. So I think we'll have another... Um, another sale of tickets next year near the, the time of the event um, and if people want to be notified of that they need to go on the wait list which is james uh, we're going to call it uh, self-publishing show.com sps live waitlist sps live waitlist yeah so get, go into there and then we'll we'll give it will probably be on a first come first serve basis i suspect we, we'll try and be as equitable as we can about that um, but then you know, from now on, it's it's the fun stuff now. So I'm actually starting to think about programming it, which again, I've never done that before, but it's quite fun. So we've got a couple of um, people already um, uh, who are signed up and a couple, uh, a very big traditional author is interested in coming. Uh, a senior, very senior Amazon member of stuff I think is coming. I'm speaking to Amazon on Friday about this. Is his name Jeff? Uh, no, no, not that no. senior. Um, no. But no, very, very senior. So in the UK, you know, top yes. level management. So that's exciting. Um, and we're starting to think about, you know, we we're going to have a, a drinks night afterwards and then on our, our, our weekly Slack or our weekly um, Zoom conference with the team this morning, someone pointed out that, yeah. not, not, I think Tom <laughs> pointed out, there were 900 people now and uh, it's, we normally just hire a pub. Yes. Um, we don't we even hire it. We just go into we the just pub and we put up. a car behind the bar. We can't, we'll, we'll still put a car behind the bar, but we, we can't, just we can't have 900 people coming into a pub so we're now looking at options for that so we you know we may um 
someone had a great idea. Oh, it was me. What a surprise. Um, that we, we might look even to hire a riverboat. Um, so we'll see. Um, it's fun. Now, this is the fun stuff. We know we've got a lot of people who want to come. So the 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 what we try to do now is to make sure they have the most um, unforgettable time that they can, and they they go away for thirty quid. For God's sake, it's ridiculous. Yes. Thirty pounds for what I think will be the best self publishing conference in the world. That is absolutely insane. Um, but there you go. That's you know Amazon want it to be cheap. We, we're happy for it to be cheap. Um, it's. It's cost effective. We'll, we'll we'll cover our costs in any profit goes to charity. Um, and so. I haven't crunched the uh, the figures yet because we've only just closed the cart. But um, uh, I think we're into three figures for sure of people flying in from the states. We've got and Australia, New Zealand, Australia, two from yeah. Hong Kong. I've yeah. seen one from Taiwan. You know, the, it's the Middle East. It's yeah. unbelievable. Really amazing. It really is. Yeah, so it'll be fun. It's- we're looking forward to it. Yeah, we're going to be on stage. You and me together is going to be our double act because this is a legendary double act. I mean, to see it live. Yeah, I said it's got to be an unforgettable experience for the right reasons, though. I want that. You know, there's a person who who goes onto our YouTube channel and says interview starts at 41 minutes because he doesn't like us. Oh yeah, there's like us. There's a word for that kind of person. Yes. Well, I want him to be there so that he can stand up and say, "Oh, for God's sake, get on with it!" You know, every year, (laughs) and we're going to just carry on with our routine. How wide do you? Ernie and Wise. Ernie and Wise. Do you mean um, Ernie er- 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 Eric and Ernie? Ernie. <laughs> uh, um, who's to dance and sing? I'm going to get all this organised. Excellent. We're going to be in rehearsals for weeks for the uh, for the routines. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's going to be really good, and uh, we're aiming big, aren't we, in terms of speakers? But we're also thinking uh, uh, thinking about making sure it's pitched correctly. There's no point in having massively successful author after massively successful author what you want to hear to hear from are people who are may you know a little bit ahead of you people who quit their well, jobs now here's another great idea who who had oh it's me again so um we uh well a bit of a spoiler for those who are coming um jeff bezos in the letter to shareholders for, for 2018 to so 2017's results pointed out that on kdp a thousand authors had made over a hundred thousand dollars in that year so I thought well, it would be interesting if we had some of those on the stage. So I did a quick little post into the Facebook group and I've actually had about 17 authors who are who meet that criteria um, who are going to be there and would like to be on stage. So we won't have all 17, but I think we'll probably pick four or five um, and then either you or I will talk to them about their experience, you know, where they've come from, where they want to go, what their lessons are, all of that kind of uh, good stuff. And that, that should be, for most people, that should be something that feels achievable so yeah. maybe they're they're three or four steps up up the ladder from where where everybody else is um but that will be something that people can go away f- from the conference feeling inspired and hopefully have picked up some uh, useful information that will help them to get to that stage and then of course you know in 2021 if we do another one um we can change the stage so there's uh, another five people who are also making a hundred thousand a year well it'd be nice if they were in the audience at the first one yeah absolutely that that was that would certainly be the that would be the aim yeah. And of course, Amazon are going to be in the room. So they'll be there to help people at whatever stage they're at. And um, yep. you know, Darren loves talking to people who are just getting going. Uh, he finds, I mm-hmm. think, the most value in his conversations at, at London Book Fair. And then, this is go- and go then fun, another fun fun idea. Who had this? Oh, it was me again. Um, the, um, we, we, should, um, we should get some t shirts. Um, and yes. now Amazon has a, a, a t shirt or kind of a merch business called Amazon Merch. Um, and maybe we can get a deal. So um, everyone gets a T-shirt um, and then a very good number. If they're sensible, I, I would definitely do this. We'll be at London Book Fair when it opens on the Tuesday. And wouldn't it be amazing if we had 500 indie authors turning up in identical yeah. branded T-shirts um, saying something about how, you know, tell me about my 70% royalties or something along, yeah, along yeah. those lines. That would be just ridiculous. And uh, 0800 70% royalty. And, and we'd, have to set up a ca- we'd have to set up a camera somewhere so we could see these people coming into the conference. Yes. And watch the reaction on the faces of all the uh, of the of the staff members on the Titanic yeah. as, uh, the, well, as lots of icebergs. Um, we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we do a lot of our thinking out loud, but we should also potentially contact LBF and say we've we've got no. this conference. Well, because they might do us a deal on tickets. Oh yes, yeah. no, that's true. No, I think that's very possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Excellent. Well, all that's uh, all that's to come. We're looking forward to that next year. We'll try not to bat on about it too much. For those of you who missed out on tickets, um, sorry about that. Oh, yes, yeah, so the final thing we should say 
here's we are going to hopefully um, mm. record this yeah. and we will have something available uh, soon for you to sign up to so you can receive the videos. We'll get it done professionally uh, afterwards. That means we won't do it. We no, 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 I've done those days. Well, look, this is how professional does this look? Um, a cut above the average podcast, I'd say. Uh, now, uh, we're where I'm speaking now, it's Tuesday, not Monday, isn't it? I'm about to fly to America with John Dyer. You're going to join us on Tuesday next week. Tom's going to be there as well. Uh, but that all would have well, when's this going? It's going on Friday, so uh, actually. No, it's going out a week on Friday. It's mm. going to be too late for uh, for Nink. But hopefully, if you came along to the drinks, that was great. Uh, anything else we want to talk about before we get into this interview? No, I think that's that's it. So uh, yes, I was just I was watching Mindhunter last night with Lucy. Watched the last episode of the fir- of the second se- season. So uh, that's all about the FBI. So I'm definitely interested to see uh, or listen to what Jerry has to say. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry uh, introduced herself to us in New York at Thriller Fest, and I had it was one of those moments where I mean, to be fair, lots of people come up to which is great, and um, and we get probably once or twice a week we get an email from somebody saying I want to be on your podcast, and we look carefully or it's going to add value and so on. I knew within about eight seconds that Jerry was going to be a good guest on this podcast. Um, she's a lovely woman, but she's lived the life. Uh, she has the the knowledge, but she also has that foot in the fiction camp, so she understands stories need to have license and move away from stuff. It's just understanding when you're doing that and when you're, uh, when you want to get it right for authenticity. So it's a really good, uh, really good subject. I'll give the uh, giveaway URL a, a away again now, which is selfpublishingshow.com forward slash FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and you can get a download. There are uh, uh, sort of a taste of the myths uh, of the FBI that people frequently get wrong. But Jerry also has a more comprehensive book on the subject. So let's hear from Jerry. Then Mark and I will be back uh, to have a chat off the back of the interview. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Jerry, welcome to the self publishing show. We have a real live bona fide FBI experienced officer. I mean, I should say former. I'm not under investigation as far as I know at the moment. <laughs> no, you're not. And I am absolutely thrilled to be here well we should say that we we met in uh, in new york you came up and said hello to us whilst we were at thriller fest and as soon as you told me your background your job and your sort of um purpose in life which is to help those people writing in the genre to get the fbi details right or at least understand when they're cutting corners and i thought straight away that my friend is a self-publishing show episode Absolutely. Thank you. And I also want to let you know, I don't think you know this, but I am an F, uh, I can say right, FPF 101 graduate. Everything that I've done as far as self-publishing, I've learned from your show and from the, uh, the course. Super. So thank well, you. Well, that's great. It's lovely to have you in the community, Jerry, and, uh, and thank you so much for taking some time out. Now, you've, you've written a book which we're going to be talking about, which is Myths and Misconceptions uh, about the FBI. And uh, we're going to go through some of those, uh, which is going to be useful. I think also you said that you can put together a little takeaway for people listening, a little PDF. Yeah, I actually have what I call an FBI reality checklist, and it goes through what I believe are some of the top 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI that I see in books, TV, and movies. And so I put, in the, I put those together. They're basically the chapters in my book, but I've put them together with you know a couple of sentences to help you get that misconception straight. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more information uh, about that in the book. But, you know, I'm also a fiction writer. So, uh, you know, I do crime fiction, too. So uh, that's how I initially you know, started in this journey. OK, well, look, let's give away uh, the URL for people to download the PDF now. So if people go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash FBI, as simple as that, uh, they'll be able to download that, uh, that PDF and we'll get that sorted out between us after the show. Um, so, Jerry, yeah, let's start with you. I think it's a really good place to start because you you have transitioned <laughs> into a, a fiction writer, and then I know this is part of your your sort of remit now. But uh, basically, you transitioned from being an FBI officer right to writing fiction. Yes, absolutely. So during my whole time in the FBI, and I was in for twenty six years, I always knew that I wanted to write a book. I'm a big crime fiction reader. I've read all my life, and I knew that I wanted to write. And during that career, towards the end, I found a case that I thought, okay, this is the perfect case. And so my goal was, 
as I was leaving the FBI to gather as much information as I could about this real case that I knew that I would fictionalize into a novel. And, uh, you know, I started working on it before I left the FBI. So what was it about this particular case that jumped out at you and and made you realize it could be a, a fiction story? Well, actually, two of my close friends in the office, two female FBI agents, very attractive women, were investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. And so they were going after a corrupt uh, commissioner who dealt with the entertainment area. uh, And, you know, they were out every day talking to strip club owners and strippers and the patrons. And when they came back to the office and they would tell their stories, I just was mesmerized. And it really was a huge case also in the paper. You know, it was covered every day in the Inquirer and in the uh, Philadelphia Daily News. And I thought, oh, this is just too sexy to... (laughs) To, to, to skip. This, this is the case. And so what I did is I created my own female FBI agent who had a, a, a troubled past and some flaws. And I put her in this situation and just kind of watched her <laughs> go a little, a, a little off. And so it's a different take on an FBI investigation. Um, I, I like to say that I look at by my stories as not just covering the investigation, but covering how that investigation affects my female FBI character and the targets that she's after. So okay. it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. That sounds great. You know, I think most TV producers would also think straight away there's, a, uh, there's an episode there which will bring us on to how they might cover that and the things that they, the cliches they might fall into then uh, maybe. Well, I can tell you one already. Go okay, on. so when. So when I was pitching, I was actually pitching this book at uh, Agent Fest, at Thriller Fest several years ago. And I remember sitting down and talking to one agent and she looked at it and she thought, yeah, you know, send, send, me, uh, send me a few chapters. And then she said, have you ever thought of the FBI agent actually going undercover as a stripper? And, you know, I was respectful and I just said, no, I don't think that would work. But I mean, come on, what kind of credibility as a law enforcement officer would this FBI agent have after she's investigated the case where she has to tell the jury <laughs> that she spent her nights, you know, taking so, off her clothes and yeah. doing lap dances? Well, uh, it, brings a, it brings a new meaning to the expression undercover, because obviously it should be. <laughs> it certainly but, does. But do you know what most producers, I think, would have that same thought they would think, yeah, because yeah, the way you described the two, you know, very attractive young agents, let's put them undercover in the strip scene and let's let that work. Now, why do we fall into that? Where is this whole mythology about the way law enforcement operates? Why is it so different from the reality? Well, I think it perpetuates itself. I mean, there have been so many books, TV shows and movies where they get it wrong. And so a lot of writers, when they do their quote unquote research, they're looking at some of those same books, TV shows, and movies. And so they keep putting in the same cliches and misconceptions. I mean, one of the biggest ones is that the FBI doesn't play well with others. I can't stand to see that. And if I'm reading a book and there's that type of language, you know, I basically take it and throw it across the room because it's, it's just so totally different than what the truth is, what reality is, that it's just one of those uh, cliches that um, unfortunately keeps continuing. Yeah. And I, I've been reading your book and uh, there's, it's a really interesting chapter on that. And you paint this picture of, of local law enforcement dealing with, you know, a homicide or a complex, serious crime, and then having a discussion with the FBI as to whether it's going to be useful to send it to their guys at Quantico and how they can help each other. It's not, as you say, as it's always portrayed on the TV, it's this sudden, oh God, here come the feds, you know, now and <laughs> now, let's get these guys away. This is our jurisdiction. <laughs> And I think in most cases, the local and state law enforcement agencies welcome the FBI because we have the resources, we have the training, we have the manpower. And, you know, if you're working on a case that is very complicated, you know, to have us come in and partner with you is one of the best things that can happen. Police agencies have a limited budget. And so if we can come in together and and work as a team, you know, it's a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah. I think I've mentioned before on uh, on the self-publishing show that 
I, I found myself unable to watch a series called Silent Witness in the UK. I've covered murder cases for the BBC, and I know the guy who goes in and does the forensic pathology on the body produces a very sober, very detailed, often very brilliant, but scientific report. And that's pretty much his involvement in the case. Exactly. You watch Silent Witness, she's knocking on doors, she's getting involved in people, she's dragging children out of cars. And I'm not thinking, on what planet does the forensic pathologist <laughs> go around solving crimes like that? Well, if you look at my book, that's chapter 17. A forensic examiner does, the, the myth is that a forensic examiner does it all, collects evidence and investigates. And that certainly is the myth. That just is not the way it is. Yeah. And it wouldn't, there's so many boundaries crossed. Um, virtually all the evidence would be inadmissible and thrown out of court as soon as it got there. Um, so let me, before we come on to the myths, and I'm excited about that aspect of this interview going down this, this, this list of myths, but let's talk a little bit more about you. So you, you, you had this story, you got this book written and then what happened? Well, I went to Thriller Fest and, you know, I won the jackpot. You know, I got an agent with uh, Curtis Brown Limited, which is one of the most respected and oldest uh, literary agencies, you know, in the country and in, and, and, and uh, the UK, too. And so I thought I had it made. But nobody ever tells you, you know, that, you know, getting the agent is just step one. And it takes, you know, it can take you a while. It took me two years to get an agent. And. I didn't realize that now the agent has to go through the same thing that I did of trying to find an editor, to trying to find a publisher for your book. And he did a great job, but wasn't successful. And I tell you the, uh, the grief, you know, I went through a period of grief because once you have an agent and they've pitched that book, it's dead if nobody buys it because it's not like there's going to be another publishing, you know, agency that comes up. There might've been some small ones, but I wasn't interested in that. Uh, so it was, it was over, but, um, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a trooper. And I just said to myself, I know this book is good. You know, I have the backing of you know, one of the most respected literary agencies that says this book is good. You know, it's been copy edited. It's been developmental, developmentally edited. Uh, it, it's tight. It is good. It is interesting. They just didn't like the fact that my female FBI agent, you know, wasn't the typical type. I mean, she's had affairs and she's done some things that uh, uh, people didn't like and, and they couldn't handle it. And so it was rejected. And I decided, you know what? I am not putting this book in a drawer. And so I uh, self-published and Thank you again for helping me, helping me with that. We're delighted that uh, Mark and, uh, and we were in the right place at the right time for you. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's really stark, isn't it? To, without self-publishing being an option to think well, that I, p people have that book. And as you say, once it's gone through one agent, that's it really. You can't, because all the agents then know it's, it's been through them and it hasn't been bought. And you can't, in the same publishers are just going to say no to somebody else. Yeah, well, you know, there's another part of the story that I, I almost forgot to mention that I did stick with Curtis Brown. So Curtis Brown has a program called uh, Agent Assisted, where they will self-publish your book for you and you get the C Curtis Brown, you know, logo on your book. And, you know, you can say that they published it. And I thought d during my grieving period that I needed that. And I probably did because, again, I had traditional publishing, you know, in my heart, in my mind and in my soul. And so when that didn't happen, you know, I was like a piece of jelly, you know, like, oh, God, what am I going to do now? And so when they offered to publish it through their program, I said, yes. And I can tell you, don't do that because you're paying them 15% for every book that sold. It's still, you know, they still get, uh, you know, their commission off of, off of your royalties. And then your book, is on their dashboard. You have no control over manipulating prices or changing covers. So it's all the uh, the uh, the prestige, quote unquote, of traditional publishing. But there's all these disadvantages that come along with it. And so I'm telling everybody out there: if anybody asks, uh, offers you to be agent assisted, it sounds good. And it makes you feel like, oh, I made it, but don't do it. You can do it yourself. I know that for a fact. I'm starting on my fourth book now, so um, yeah. self-publish. Good, good <laughs> advice from experience there. And yeah. how has it gone then since you took the self-publishing route? 
It's gone great. And I think one of the reasons that it's gone great, again, is because, and we haven't mentioned this, is because of the podcast. I mean, the podcast uh, that I do, FBI Retired Case File Review, is, you know, a, a great uh, content marketing lead magnet kind of for, for my book. So, you know, I'm talking to people every day. Each episode is averaging you know, about 10,000 downloads within the first month or so. And so these are the people that I'm talking to every day. And these are the people that are buying my books. And so that was a brilliant move by yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> A brilliant move that I didn't know was a brilliant move, uh, that, and uh, it's worked out well. And just to clarify, that that audience, the lead magnet, is, is for the fiction books or for the nonfiction book? It has. I have found since I just published the, the nonfiction book, it's only been out for a little over a month, that it is working much, much, much better for the nonfiction book, but it does pretty well for the fiction too. That's really interesting because uh, I'm going to be giving a talk at Nink about uh, doing a podcast and whether authors should do a podcast. And I'm talking a lot to people at the moment. Um, and in the fiction space, you know, it's a really finely balanced decision whether it's going to be worth your time and effort to do a podcast to bring readers in. For some areas, it does seem to work. And it seems like you've hit upon one. Yeah. And I, I think it's also because from the very beginning, from my very first episode, I talked about sharing case reviews from retired special agents with some of the biggest cases that the FBI has ever investigated. But I also said that this podcast would talk about, you know, the FBI and books, TV and movies. And so many of the agents, uh, over 50 of them, that I bring on have their own books, whether it's nonfiction or fiction or true crime or memoirs. And so we do talk a lot about books throughout. So I have a part of my audience who are readers and writers, uh, as well as, of course, people who are interested in pursuing a career with the FBI. Superb. Well, I might tap you up for a, a little bit of a case study to include in my, uh, my talk in Nink in that case after we've done this. Okay, so you have, you've had success, which I'm really delighted uh, about, really pleased. And ultimately, from a financial point of view, you should be grateful that you didn't get that publishing deal. Yeah, and I know that now. Boy, do I know that now. Yeah, I, would, uh, I was actually, of course, you know, we met at, at Thriller Fest, and a number of people still don't get it. And this is what I can say. The people that I have met early when I was attending Thriller Fest, and I've gone seven times, that were looking for a publishing deal when I was looking for a publishing deal are still looking for a publishing deal. And I just don't get it. You know, if you truly believe in your work, why would you wait? It's really eight years because I skipped one of the Thriller Fest. Why would you wait eight years to get your book published? You know, if you truly believe in it and you try, you, you want to go traditional, I can understand some people don't have the business um, skills that you need to self-publish. And we've got to admit that. But if you truly believe in your book and it's just not happening, I mean, eight years? Yeah. I, right. I don't Crazy. <laughs> okay. Right, Jerry, I want to move on to the fun part. This has been fun so far, but uh, to the bit I've been Good. looking forward to most uh, about this interview, which is to go through some of the myths and bust some of them and help people uh, who are writing. And of course, it's not just procedural and crime. The FBI can come into romance books, into all sorts of genres. Absolutely. You know, when I'm talking about uh, creative license and creative compromises, I understand the need for that. You know, sometimes even if you know what you're writing is not necessarily accurate, you need to manipulate it in order to tell the story. I've actually done that myself in my crime novels. You know, I, I cringe, but I have to do it because, say, for instance, uh, in a reality, a piece of evidence in a court scene is authenticated before you can talk about the evidence. But if it doesn't work that way, I need the person to show the evidence before they bring on the person to authenticate it, then I'm going to switch it around. I'm just going to do that. But the great thing about it is I know that I have made a creative compromise. And so what I'm saying, you know, in my book and in and, and, and this checklist is at least know that you're making a mistake or at least know that you're manipulating, you know, the accurate way of doing it instead of being ignorant you know, of, of the fact that 
what you have in your book is just not the way it's done. I mean, when we talk about uh, cliche number two, which is that FBI profilers are hunting serial killers. Well, I can't tell people you know, to write how it's accurate because then there would not be a serial killer genre because all of those books show the FBI profiler, you know, running down a dark alley or into a dark basement chasing a serial killer. And profilers are really academics. You know, they're, they're sitting back at the FBI Academy receiving reports and files and going through them, trying to help police officers around the country and FBI agents around the country solve unsolvable cases. But they're not out there in the field investigating them. Yeah. Well, we have Thomas Harris to thank, I think, for the explosion. Yes. In- <laughs> I, bl- I blame him. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Along with Jody Foster and, you know, the whole gang. And, uh, and the, whole, the whole premise of those books, um, and particularly, of course, the, the film with Hannibal Lecter's, you know, compelling ability to, to work out the profile of the person that Agent Starling's after. And, and subsequently, I mean, every TV episode does seem to have the profiler turning up at the scene and then telling them this is what they're going to do next and this is why they've done it. It's not, and you're saying, you're telling us it's just simply not like that. It's simply not like that. And I have lots of episodes with uh, profilers, FBI profilers, retired FBI profilers, and agents who have actually worked alongside local police departments on serial killer cases. I I interviewed uh, uh, Dan Kraft, who was the FBI agent who worked in Wisconsin with the police there on the Jeffrey Dahmer case. And he interviewed him four times, but he'll be the first one to tell you that that Jeffrey Dahmer case is a, they're they're local murders, they're state murders. Uh, So, and although he participated as a local FBI agent, not as a profiler back in the field, those were cases that were under the jurisdiction uh, at the leads were the police officers and the detectives and not the FBI. Okay. So what we can have, and the detail of all of this is in the book, so we're not going to go into a, you know, a huge amount of detail on each one of these, but um, what you can have is that information being fed into the investigators, whether it be the locals or, or an FBI-led investigation, rather than having this um, this person, as you say, running down the dark alley in the end. <laughs> Superhero. <laughs> Superhero stuff. Okay, let's go to yeah. another one. Another one we always see in the FBI, that most FBI agents are white males and female agents are always single. Yes. Oh, that really irritates me. And that's one of the things that I did in my book. Of course, my lead is a black female FBI agent. Uh, and I gave her three kids, not one. I gave her three kids. In Hollywood, you're yes. only allowed one kid. <laughs> well, I think it complicates the story if yeah. you're going to have to include these kids in it. But that's the reality. Uh, most veteran female FBI agents are married and have kids just like their male you know, counterparts. Uh, they're only about 20% of the workforce is female. And when it comes to black females, it's like 1%. So it's a cliche and it's not a cliche because the majority of of FBI agents, 70% are white males, but it's changing in the FBI. I can do like a recruiting, um, (laughs) a, a, a recruiting message right now, but the FBI is always looking to, bring more women and minorities into its ranks because uh, for all law law enforcement agencies, you know, diversity is the key. They need to have agents in the, um, in the field that represent the community that they serve. So you joined a long time ago, Joe, you must've been somewhat of a pioneer or must've felt like that to you. I was the 23rd black female that came into the FBI. And I know that by fact, because I have the EEO stats from uh, a few months after I entered and it was like, oh, there's 24. Well, (laughs) I must be 25 because there's somebody who came in behind me. Uh, So, yeah, it was an interesting time. Uh, And I've got some war stories to tell on that one. But I, I usually keep those to myself because things change. Oh, things change as I gained more experience and as more women came in and more minorities came in. And by the time I left, uh, there was there were no war stories to tell, only, you know, a fabulous, fascinating career you know, that I used to write my books. <laughs> well, yeah, I can well believe uh, that you were there during that transition. And it must have been there must have been some hard. Ca- I guess we're going to 
call it character forming uh, early years, but you you must be tough, Jerry, to get through that and to grow. Yeah, yeah. I have, I worked most of my career. I worked fraud and corruption, what we call economic crime, Ponzi schemes, advance fee schemes, and uh, business to business telemarketing cases. I was extremely successful. I had a case that made it to American Greed. Uh, the the big TV show on CNBC and, uh, you know, got lots of awards. And I think the most interesting thing about my career is that somebody who came in kind of unsure of themselves in the last five years of my career, I actually was the spokesperson for the Philadelphia FBI office. My full-time job was to deal with the media Uh, TV producers, movie producers, writers, making sure that they got the perception of the FBI correct. So this is not something that I'm doing now uh, that I just made up. I I was doing it in the FBI in my last five years. And so I really feel that I'm coming to readers and writers with a strong knowledge of the FBI. Uh, I think my book is the only one out there that is FBI procedures for writers okay well let's carry on i'm going to skip a few of the myths um okay and go to number nine which is that agents use intimidation and threats during interrogations and the reason i pulled this one up because it's a very common portrayal oh, when the invest- when the interview starts you get this kind of bullying pushing fun sometimes physical uh, confrontation and of course that's great drama Yeah, it is great drama, but it is totally untrue. One of the things about the FBI is every FBI agent is mandated to have sources, informants, cooperating witnesses, assets. And so whenever you go into a situation, you're always thinking, hey, you know, I'm talking to this person. I'm interviewing this person today. I might be able to get him to cooperate and become an informant for me. So you're never going to treat anybody poorly. You know, and and the most important thing is if you coerce somebody into providing you information, that that evidence could be thrown out in court in a minute. You know, if they if that can be proven. So the FBI actually in a in an interview situation is going to go out and ask the guy if he needs any coffee. Can I get you anything? Can I get you any coffee? Water? You want a soda? Are you hungry? We are going to set the mood. We're going to build that rapport. We are going to have it so that the person wants to cooperate. You know, it's that old honey versus vinegar situation. You know, if you if you let the person know, hey, I'm here for you. You know, I just want to work this out. I just want to hear your side of the story. Boy, that's when they start, as they say, vomiting yeah. <laughs> information. Singing like, you know, a, not- singing like a canary, as I say, in yes. uh, East End London. Um, yeah, Exactly. And I, I certainly have seen that before when you, the less glamorous side of sitting through Crown Court cases in the UK, uh, so I used to do, is the bits where they start contesting the evidence. And very often, if they haven't in the UK, is an, uh, something called PACE, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, and it, set, it sets the timetable, the framework, you know, how long you can hold somebody, all the rest of it. I mean, the, the police officers kind of hate it because they have to live their life by it. But you make a mistake under PACE, at a critical stage in a big investigation, they will come back and haunt you very quickly absolutely. in a court case because the defend- you know, absolutely they'll get all that stuff thrown out, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. And and do we truly believe that if you have this bad guy, this criminal who's been committing crimes, especially violent crimes all his life, is gonna get scared because somebody pointed their finger in their face and you know threaten them oh okay i'll tell you i'll tell you yeah. it's just so it's so laughable sometimes but you know it does create trauma so as long as you know the reality if yeah. you really want to put that scene in your book go ahead put it in your book yeah. but the reality well, is it's just the opposite the, a good way to put it in your book was to have it in there and then have the evidence thrown out and have the guy in trouble yes. because of it so then you can get both uh, both the accuracy yeah. and uh, and the there fun that's what you call innovation. There you go. There's always a way around it. Uh, okay, I'm going to pick another one here. And this is kind of is a jurisdiction thing. I can see it, it, it obviously riles a little bit with you, is that people portray the CIA hunting spies in the United States. Is that an FBI role yes. then? You know, that, yeah. Yeah, that's the FBI is the lead agency when it comes to domestic intelligence. Um, and I hate, I know people who work counter and help and 
excuse me, counterintelligence hate when I say this, but the reality is that the CIA, they're our spies. We send them out to other countries to gather evidence and inf- I mean, intelligence and information. You know, so when people come into our country to do that same thing, it's the FBI. We're the law enforcement agency. The CIA has no law enforcement uh, capabilities at all. So when a spy comes in, we may work with them and are and helping to identify who the people are. But when it comes to the investigation and the arrest and any type of court action, that's the FBI. Okay, it makes mm-hmm. sense when you explain like the CIA are the people who send. Our, as you say, the U.S. spies out. Okay, mm-hmm. this is one that surprised me. Uh, you say this is a myth, right? Number 16, FBI agents investigate murders, don't they? Yes, but no. Okay. So there, there initially there was no federal violation that involved murder at all. I think somewhere like in the 1990s, there became, uh, you know, federal violations when you had murders that involved a criminal enterprise or RICO investigation or or something like that. But in most cases, the types of murders that the FBI investigates are those murders that occur on federal property. So if there was a a murder on a military base and it was committed by a non-military person, the FBI would investigate that. If there was a murder on the high seas and it, you know, the, the FBI would investigate that. A murder in the federal building, a murder in an uh, uh, Indian reservation, those would be are in, in, you know, in a park, a federal park. Those would be under the FBI's investigation. But a lot of movies and TV shows have you know, a local murder. You know, a house is bombed and the FBI is investigating it. Now, it may be associated with a case of theirs, but that's a local murder. That's a state homicide that's going to be investigated by a local police t- department or a state uh, police. Uh, there are very uh, limited situations where the FBI involves murder. There's always, this is the way that, to remember it, there's always another federal violation in play when the FBI is involved in a murder. You know, of course, you know, a murder of an, a federal officer, you know, is something that the FBI would do. But there's always another federal violation in play. For instance, in a hate crime, you know, when we investigate the murder, a racially motivated murder, it's not the murder we're investigating. It's the civil rights investigation. It's the civil rights violation that we're investigating. That's interesting. Which begs the question for me that how the FBI grew, because you've got, if you've got law, I mean, law is very localized in America. I mean, every state seems to have its own law. You know, the courts run differently from one state to the other. Each county in district has its police and its investigation departments where in history of the united states did somebody think we need a police force if you like and law enforcement that sits above them all well the fbi was actually created in 1908 and so it's been around for a very long time but it was initially involved in handling those cases that involved interstate commerce you know so uh, it, the interstate aspect of it you know, the nationally focused aspect of crime is where the FBI comes in. You know, when it, when it comes to big things like organized crime or with terrorism, you know, we are a nationally focused law enforcement agency. But in many times, there is a joint jurisdiction. But in, in, in many of those cases, the FBI is the lead person because the federal penal- penalties are much higher. Okay, that does make sense. And I think in the UK, we're seeing a bit of um, uh, this cross county lines, county lines, drug dealing and gangs going on at the moment. And it's a problem because they deliberately exploit the fact that there's a bureaucratic difference between the regions. So I can see how the FBI was uh, was founded to combat that. Okay, I want to go through a couple more of these. We're racing okay. through the time, which is great, but I am loving this. And I think it's quite gripping, regardless of what you write, Thank actually. You. This, is Thank another, you. this is another myth that, that jumped out at me from your book. Uh, bomb tech is a dangerous job. You, you stated yeah. that as a myth. Well, yeah, and you know, that was one for me that kind of like ding, 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 the the light bulbs went off when I interviewed Kevin Miles, who is a retired agent and a master bomb tech with the FBI. And he said that. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And he's explaining that on TV shows and books, you know, they talk about, you know, hand manipulation, you know, where they 
un untie the red wire from the green wire. He says that doesn't happen anymore. Everything is automated. You know, they have the robots that go in. And so for most situations, they have, you know, a, a, again, a robotic handling of that bomb to detonate it or to look at it and assess it. And the main job of the bomb tech is the post blast investigation. So the bomb has already exploded. They come in and now they're looking for the evidence to prove that it was a bomb and where how that bomb was made and see if they can uh, relate what they find in the evidence back to the person who did the bomb. And so their job is, you know, not dressing up in that big hurt locker, yeah. you know, type uniform and going out and actually disarming a bomb. They just don't do that uh, uh, anymore. And find, Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess the military de depiction of, uh, you mentioned Hurt Locker there and uh, the EOD stuff, I guess that's played into people's minds and they just think that's that's their their take on bomb disposal. Right. And, you know, and theirs, of course, is more immediate, you know, and, and uh, they, they're not going to have some of those uh, equip that equipment that I talked about, you know, with them as they're driving the Humvee along uh, along the, you know, the, the desert uh, road. But definitely in the United States, when you talk about a bomb tech, you know, even for a police department, you know, they're not sending somebody in. OK, Joe, <laughs> go go take care of that bomb. It just doesn't happen that way. So yeah. I, I, I found that fascinating, too. Very. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, your last myth that you've, you've titled, and I have skipped lots of these, uh, but your last myth here is that FBI agents are perfect and never get into trouble. And when I think yeah. about it, you're right, that is how they are. When the FBI is rather one-dimensionally portrayed, quite often they come in, there's a jurisdiction argument at the beginning. In the end, ultimately, they, they sort of use their magic uh, psychoanalysis to solve the crime. And not many of them are flawed. No. And... I will say this, that the FBI really has this unbelievable culture and this unbelievable cold, code of don't embarrass the Bureau. I mean, that is ingrained in you. And so there, was a, there were times where you were hearing, like, say, the Secret Service agent always, Secret Service agents always getting in trouble with prostitutes and all of that stuff. And you never heard that about the FBI. And that's because this don't embarrass the Bureau culture is ingrained in you. I mean, the FBI has been around for more than 110 years and our reputation has been built by every single agent. And so when you, you know, diverge from that pure, you know, uh, uh, image, uh, you know, you're smacked pretty hard. And so we have had people who have done some really boneheaded things. I mean, terrible things like Robert Hansen, who, of course, sold, you know, secrets uh, and, and gave them to the, the, the Russians, you know, and caused many deaths, you know, uh, from military people and, and uh, our, some of uh, the CIA's in, informants and, and, co and FBI's cooperators. And we've had F FBI agents who have murdered their informants. Um, and of course, you, you know what's happening now, even though I don't necessarily consider uh, a, a lot of that the way some people do. I don't think there is a conspiracy in leadership in the FBI to, you know, to take down. I, it just can't happen, which is you know, w what you have to look at when you talk about a conspiracy theory. But yeah, the FBI has in its past done some things that the American pub uh, uh, public have taken a second look at. But for the most part, I mean, you just don't hear those things about the FBI because we really believe in fidelity, bravery, and integrity. And that integrity part is, you know, deep in every FBI agent's DNA and their mindset. You better just spell out to people, uh, Jerry, where people can get the book, what it's called, and also your podcast. Yeah, the book again is FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a mind. <laughs> I don't even know the title of my own book. <laughs> I think that's right, isn't it? FBI Myths and Misconceptions. Yeah, but it's a it's a uh, a manual for armchair detectives is the uh, the subtitle, and that book is available everywhere. So I know that Mark talks a lot about Amazon. Now, I decided to put it everywhere, and I mean it is everywhere that you can get it. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, again, doing very well. Uh, my website is jerrywilliams.com, and the podcast is FBI Retired Case File Review. 
and I have 178 episodes that you can listen to of retired agents talking about every single violation that you can imagine. So if you're working on a novel about organized crime, I probably have 10 interviews that you can listen to there. If you're doing something on spies and, and counterintelligence, I probably have 10 there. It's, I've, got, I've interviewed on every, I've done an interview on every violation of the FBI that I could think of. Well, and they're all there and they're free. <laughs> what a fantastic repository uh, for history as well, not just uh, for use oh, yeah. for authors. So fantastic, Jerry. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think, you know, I'm already starting to think back to everything I've seen that involved the, the FBI. And uh, I'm thinking of Agent Dale Cooper in Twin Peaks. And now I'm wondering, well, why did he turn up to investigate a murder? A local, yeah, yeah. a local murder. So all these things, of course, we just took. I, I, I said the same thing when the show came out. Um, say, can I add one more thing that I? That yeah, I've you done? go ahead. There's a new TV show. Most people know about the FBI from TV shows and books. And there's a new TV show that came out last year called FBI on on our on CBS channel. And last year. I did a blog post on every single episode. There's, there were 23 of them, which I was shocked because I was hoping that it was only going to be 12 or 13. So it became a part-time job. But for every episode, I went in and I reviewed what they got right and what they got wrong. And again, I shouldn't say right and wrong, but where they took a, uh, a creative compromise. And I said, this is the way they show it on the show. This is the way it really would happen. And so I think that would be also something that would be very helpful to people writing crime fiction involving the FBI to take a look at those blog posts. And I'm going to do it again this season. Fantastic. What a brilliant way of, uh, of uh, using your knowledge and people learning from you. Jerry, that's what we've done. We've learned from you. It's been really, I knew it would be, I knew from the moment you, you spoke to me <laughs> in the Grand Hyatt in New York that this was going to be a good interview. So I'm really pleased you've come along. Uh, remind people that they can go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash FBI to get your handy PDF takeaway and they can yes. go and find your book. And I want to wish you success with your books. Thank you. Going forward. And I also want to say thank you for your service in law enforcement. I mean, it's a de dedication that's decades of, uh, of service to your country, and uh, we appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. Very impressive, Jerry. Lovely woman as well. And um, uh, I found that really interesting. It's, it's an interesting area. Uh, you operate in your books in the sort of um, semi-fictitious world where spies are, you know, is not as easily understood how they operate. So you have license, I think, license to kill. You have license to move a little bit away from procedure when it suits you. Mm. People who write police procedurals in the UK and the United States of America, part of the appeal of that is they do replicate or follow actual real life so it's more important for them less important for you perhaps and somewhere in the middle for most of us to, to have the authenticity well remember i am writing a police procedural at the moment so um i am very much into the into that world right now and i have a separate little uh, facebook group with about 10 um experts in it with um mostly police serving or retired uk police officers and um what else i've got uh, a, a criminal barrister um, so there's a lot of it's a kind of a courtroom drama as well. So I've, I need you know I, I obviously I am a lawyer, but I've never practiced criminal law, so um, I wouldn't know my ass or my elbow when it came to most of that. So I've got someone helping me with that. So um, it's been very useful. The, I had a scene at the start of the book um, with a, a, a multiple murder is found, um, bodies are found in this isolated farmhouse, and um, although it's based on a true a, a real life um, story. So I could read about what actually happened um, 25 years ago. I, the way I wrote it, I sent it to um, a fairly senior detective um, uh, sergeant in the Met who has done a couple of quite uh, well-known cases. And he said, um, well, you know, armed response was turning up because if there's, there's, they think someone is still in the house with a gun, you're going to wait till armed response comes. For, you know, for American listeners, our police aren't armed. Um, so um, if something like that happens, they have to call, call for an armed response car to turn up. And so he was giving me lots of procedure on 
who they would call, um, which officer would be in charge for effectively authorizing lethal force, all of that kind of stuff, which was, is quite hard to find that out. So it's very useful to have those kinds of connections who can um, point me in the right direction. Is it the Bamba case you've based your... It is the Bamba case, yes. Uh, that's a really interesting real world uh, case. Mm. Well. Yeah, I think it's coming to annoyingly. I didn't only realise this about three months ago. ITV are making a, a dramatisation of it, um, oh, are they? Oh. which is very, very annoying because it hasn't yes. been. No one has. I said that to no. I said to people, "Have you heard of Jeremy Bamber?" And a lot, a lot of the times, like, nope. Now, of course, a lot of these people are younger than us, but it, yes. you know, this was this was eighty. I don't know, eighty five. I think it happened. Um, so I wasn't that old, uh, but it was it was a big case. It was a very yeah. big case because he's a very handsome chap yeah. and he's quite and glamorous. He, he's the son, and he was in on TV making the appeals, and mm. and it was quite a long time before he was arrested. And police to this day call it doing a bamba when you're at a crime scene and you're you're missing the really obvious thing is that the one person you're talking to who looks completely innocent as one of the victims actually was the perp. Um, According, so, according to yeah, according to them, he still, which is weird. Thirty years later, he still protests innocence, which is I think yes, is interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's a very interesting case. So anyway, yeah. that's that's my jumping off point for the house in the woods, which is what the new one is called. Um, and I'll be, yeah, it's fun. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Came up with some good ideas. What um, dog walks over the weekend, as I usually do. So that was that was good. Thank you about Atticus. Yes, Atticus Priest. That's him. Excellent. Good. Okay. Well, look, uh, I want to say thank you so much indeed to Jerry Williams uh, for her interview today. And a uh, reminder, you can go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash FBI uh, to download a free PDF that she's created just for us uh, with the things that people get right and wrong about the FBI to help you with that side of things. And uh, that's it. I will give out the waitlist URL again, I guess, which is selfpublishingshow.com forward slash SP s live wait list all one word type thing um, and if tickets become available for the show uh, in march we will roll them out to people on that wait list in order that's it good well, i'm getting on a plane i shall not we're going to record another yeah. episode we're doing another episode oh yeah we're, absolutely we're going to batch two together so i shall say goodbye properly in a minute but for now because we always do this i'm going to say it's goodbye from him and it's goodbye from me goodbye goodbye Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.